Good morning to you all and welcome to today's webinar for Aptar's Dispense Your Genius Challenge brought to you by Nine Sigma. My name is Jonathan Yakushoff from Nine Sigma and I'll be your host and moderator today. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. The recording and transcription will be made available on the Dispense Your Genius Challenge page. First, let's review our agenda for today. I'll begin with some introductions of our speakers and then representatives from APTAR will tell us more about their organization. Next, our panelists will discuss the project in greater depth. We'll conclude by addressing your questions during our live Q&A session, followed by a brief summary of project information, including how to request additional information or assistance. As we proceed through today's presentation, please feel free to ask your questions at any time. We'll keep track of your questions and respond to them during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Moving along now, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today's webinar. First, from Aptar, we have Luciana Varecki, Global Marketing Specialist, and Padolfo Haney, Director, Global Market Development. And from Nine Sigma, we're joined by Pam Semenik, Senior Program Manager. Thank you all for joining us today. We'll begin with Padolfo. Could you please tell our attendees more about Aptar? Sure. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, well, thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, as, uh, as Jonathan said, we're going to start uh, telling you a little bit about AFTER and how we are structured. So AFTER or the AFTER group uh, is basically formed by three different segments. Uh, we have AFTER Beauty and Home, uh, where we have products for the beauty, personal care, and home care markets. AFTER Food and Beverage, uh, so we're focused on uh, food and beverage only, and after pharma. And in this segment, we have products for prescription drugs, uh, consumer health care, and injectables. So moving along, uh, we're going to see that um, uh, we are a global company. So we have over 50 facilities uh, operating in uh, 20 different countries. Um, so we're basically present all over the world. And with that, as we're going to see on the next slide, uh, we have a pretty good coverage of uh, many different customers globally. So we, our main customers uh, are Kraft Heinz, uh, Coca-Cola, Red Gold, uh, Danone, Mead Johnson. So as you can see, lots of big companies, global companies, uh, Nestle, Conagra, Kroger, Abbott. Uh, so we have a very good uh, a list of customers. We're proud of that. Uh, we have not only global companies as our customers, but we also have uh, regional companies in, in, in a lot of cases. So uh, I would say that we make business with the majority of the big companies around the world uh, in each one of the regions where we play. Uh, so as we go into the next slide, uh, we just want to share a little bit of history with you, uh, especially now talking about the sauces and condiments uh, market. So it, when we think about packaging uh, in that market, uh, we're going to see that uh, for actually centuries now, the main packaging was mainly uh, glass bottles. So. In the beginning, we had glass bottles with corks and then glass bottles with metal lugs. And it actually took a, a very long time for that uh, to start evolving. So, and I would say that the first big innovation came in the 80s when the plastic bottles were introduced to this market. Well, after is a dispensing solution provider so we don't make plastic bottles. We make plastic uh, closures, pumps, uh, sprayers, and so on. And with that plastic bottle, it actually enabled us to have a plastic dispensing closure. So we created a flip-top closure uh, that improved consumer experience when using a plastic bottle because now they were able to squeeze the bottle to get the product out. Now. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, we changed that a little bit and, and we revolutionized the market once again when we introduced what we call the inverted line of products 
So we created a closure uh, with a silicon valve that would give customers and consumers a lot more control over the amount of product that they were dispensing and enable the packages to be inverted, to be uh, upside down. So as you know, and it's, it's a very um, uh, known uh, as consumers, ketchup bottles or, or, or mustard or mayo, you used to uh, tap at the bottom of the bottle to get the product out or, or you would have to squeeze the bottle really hard. So by inverting the packaging, we allowed a, a lot more control and again, an improved experience to consumers. So now as we uh, embark in this journey, uh, looking for the next big idea uh, and, and what is the innovation uh, we're now gonna bring to the market, uh, that's what we're trying to do again. We're trying to improve consumers' experience and give them something new that can revolutionize the market once again. And uh, that's where uh, your ideas are going to be very welcome and, and have a very uh, important role uh, in, in this project. So when we look at the existing dispensing solutions for sauces and condiments, uh, these are the main components that we typically see. So we usually have a flip top uh, lid so it's a, a closure uh, with um, a valve, a silicone valve uh, in it. And the valve is there to allow more control, as we said, but also it helps to avoid uh, product spill or leakage. Uh, and then we have a liner. We have typically an aluminum liner. And this aluminum liner is there for basically uh, two main reasons. Uh, besides providing safety, and protecting the product inside by um, uh, giving a good oxygen barrier. Uh, it also helps on the product sealing, especially during the supply chain, during transportation. So between the moment where the product is being filled uh, into the container and the moment that that package is gonna reach uh, the consumer. So those are ba basically the three components that we have uh, in the existing solutions. And they're all there for certain reasons as we're gonna see on the next slide. Uh, so basically, the existing challenges that we have when we talk about sauces and condiments uh, packages is first and foremost is the sealing performance. So the closures are there uh, as a primary reason to uh, seal the bottle, seal the container. So you don't get product leakage throughout the distribution. Uh, but also there are many other uh, reasons why we, we have a closure or a sealing solution there. So as I mentioned, oxygen barrier is one challenge that we, we always need to be conscious of. Uh, a lot of products, they're uh, oxygen sensitive. So they could be sensitive because of uh, oxygen might cause discoloration or it might actually degrade the product inside. So there are different reasons why we need uh, a good oxygen barrier uh, to be put in place. Uh, also, the closure uh, can act as a, a clean dispensing uh, solution uh, and also allow for a total uh, dispense of the product that is inside. So uh, it's important to have a good balance between those so you can have uh, you can add value to consumers as they're using the product. Uh, it has to be simple, it's, it has to be easy to use, it has to be intuitive to, for consumers to use. Uh, of course, uh, scalability is important. Uh, there are billions and billions of uh, sauces and, and condiments products in the world and uh, the solution that we want to uh, we want to develop needs to be something that we can scale and, and produce in different regions and different places. Uh, convenience, so consumer convenience is probably uh, one of the, uh, the buzzwords today uh, that we hear the most. So bringing convenience to consumers is very, very important in any market and in this market is no different. Uh, safety, not only from a product perspective, perspective to keep the product safe inside, uh, but also to keep the consumer safe. Uh, so tamper evidence 
and uh, make sure that uh, the packaging is arriving at the consumer house and it has not been tampered with. Uh, of course, uh, sustainability. Um, we're always looking into ways how we can uh, reduce material consumption or uh, work with uh, uh, recyclable materials and so on. Uh, customization. So customers, uh, brand owners, they always want to have uh, a way to convey their message through packaging as well. And a lot of times uh, they want to have the ability to customize their solution, their packaging, uh, and affordability. So, of course, whatever we do today, it needs to be affordable. Uh, it needs to be uh, competitive. So those are the main challenges that we have when we're talking about developing a new dispensing solution for sauce and content. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Thank you very much, Adolfo. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, let me just uh, talk a little bit about uh, the contest itself and what we're looking uh, for uh, and, and this contest. So, as you can see, like there is a, a very good solution out there in the market, and there are actually several different ways that you can dispense sauces and condiments. But what we're looking for is something new, something innovative. Uh, something that maybe is even used in a different industry, but not uh, in sauces and condiments. Uh, but it's something that can revolutionize the way that consumers use the products today. Uh, it needs to be something that can dispense viscose products like uh, ketchup, mayo, mustard, uh, and so on. Um, and also needs to uh, cope with the, the challenges of uh, e-commerce. Uh, so e-commerce is growing and it's growing fast and with it it's changing a little bit the way that uh, the supply chain works. So what we're looking for when we talk about something uh, revolutionary or, or innovative, uh, we're looking for functional design elements. So it can be something that is going to change the, the design of the solutions today, uh, not from an uh, an aesthetic perspective, so we don't want just something that looks different, but it, it has to add functionality to it. Uh, it could be components, so we could be talking about a different component that can be integrated to our existing solutions today, uh, or it can be a, a brand new technology or, or a technology that is new to this uh, industry. Uh, and then as we were seeing, uh, the main deliverables in this case is uh, we need to have a clean uh, controlled dispense uh, and it needs to be very convenient for consumers to use. Okay? Very, <clears throat> excuse me, very good, Adolfo. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn now to Pam Semenik from Nine Sigma. Uh, Pam, could you tell us more about some of the possible awards for this contest? Sure, and thanks, Adolfo, for going through the detailed description of the contest. So really this contest is looking for novel methods and mechanisms that are revolutionary in how they dispense viscous food products. Aptar will award up to five entries with um, a $10,000 cash prize each. Um, and also the uh, prize winners will have the ability to work with Aptar to develop your solution in greater detail. Um, in addition to that, Aptar may select other solutions for further evaluation and a relationship with Aptar. The evaluation criteria is listed on this slide, and um, you can also see this in more detail on the, the contest summary on the website. But remember that what Aptar is looking for is a novel experience, something that could improve the customer experience, the consumer experience, something that also may improve the product safety and security of the product, as well as address and respond to the expected e-commerce challenges. So please um, look at the website for further details about the criteria. All the submissions must come through the Nine Sites website. There is a web portal that is a form that we're going to ask all potential solution providers to fill out in as much detail as possible. Um, you are also able to include other files as attachments, such as things like technical drawings, 
maybe some performance data. Um, if you have a, a video to demonstrate your mechanism, we ask that it be a private video and you can't upload the video, but we, we would like you to upload a link to that video and you could do that again through the website. Please remember that we cannot receive any submissions through any other method, so we, we can't accept email. Everything has to come through the web portal. I think you missed a slide. Can you? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, guys. Okay, so contest timeline. Um, submission deadline is November 15th at 5 p.m. Eastern. So please, um, we often have a lot of submissions coming in uh, close to that, that submission deadline. Um, we are here to help you if you are having issues with um, your submission um, and if you have questions about submitting through the portal. Um, please do note, though, that we do close our portal to submissions at 5 p.m., so we do encourage you to submit early. The winners will be announced in February of 2018. Um, we always get questions about intellectual property. Uh, we do ask that all submissions be um, of a non-confidential nature only. We cannot accept any uh, confidential information through this contest, um, and we will not accept that through our website. Um, once winners are selected, they will be asked to sign a confidentiality agreement with APTAR in order to win the cash award. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Pam. Uh, we are now to the part of the webinar that involves frequently asked questions. These are questions that are either common to other Nine Sigma projects or ones that have already been asked via the Nine Sigma Provider Help Desk. Our very first question, can one person submit multiple ideas or entries? Uh, Pam, how about you take that one? I can take that one. Um, and, and actually, Hadolfo, if you want to jump in too on any of these, um, you know, that's great. Um, you can submit multiple ideas, but please put them in as separate entries. So if your ideas are uh, different, significantly different, we don't want you to uh, lump them all together. We do want you to create a new entry for each idea. Okay. Great. Uh, Adolfo, I think this next one will probably be for you. Uh, why is a CDA, a, a confidential disclosure agreement, necessary for post-challenge interactions? Yeah, so um, basically I think this is, a, this is a protection for both parties. So uh, after we award an idea, that's when the, the interaction between the two parties is going to start. So uh, the person presenting the idea and, and after. And at that point, uh, we're going to be exchanging information and they, they might be confidential information. So for that reason, uh, we put the CDA in place because up to that point, you don't need to uh, provide any confidential information as Pan just uh, highlighted. Uh, but maybe in order for us to be able to understand or better understand the solution or replicate and test, uh, we might need to have access to confidential information. Uh, and at the same time, in order to be able to maybe adapt a solution to our reality, we might need to uh, share some confidential information. So it's just a way to protect both parties uh, and make sure that we're going to have uh, a fruitful uh, interaction between the parties. Very good. Thank you, Adolfo. Uh, I think our remaining two FAQs, I think we'll probably stay with you for them. Uh, so the next question is, I have a solution which is commercial today, but not being used for sauces and condiments. Can I still submit my idea? Yeah, sure. So we're looking for something innovative in the packaging industry. So there might be a technology being used somewhere else. Uh, I don't know, maybe in the automotive industry that we don't know about and uh, we can uh, adapt and, and apply to our needs here. So yeah, absolutely no problem if the idea is already somewhere else. When we say it needs to be something new and innovative, it needs to be something new to our market. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, what do you mean by a solution which can withstand supply chain challenges related to e-commerce? All right, that's a, that's a great question too. Um, so basically, the way the packages were developed in the past, uh, they were supposed to expand what we say brick and mortar uh, retail uh, supply chain. So basically, the if you think about the 
brand owners, they would produce their products, they would put in a pallet, that pallet would go inside a truck and transport it to the point of sale. Uh, once it would reach a retail store, uh, they would remove the packages from the pallet and place them in, in the shelves. So consumers would go to a store, buy their products, and bring them home. So now with uh, e-commerce, that supply chain is getting a lot more complex. So the first thing to remember is now there are multiple touch points to the packaging and the packaging is handled a lot more than it was on brick and mortar. So the brand owner might uh, fill the packages, put them in a pallet, and then they ship it to a warehouse. In this warehouse, the pallets are going to be uh, disassembled and put it into many different boxes. Then uh, they might go into one box individually, or they might go into a box with a lot of other items. So then when consumers buy that product, that particular product might be shipped by air or it might be shipped by truck and it might be standing inside a truck the whole day during a hot summer or the cold winter and all those changes in temperatures might affect the packaging inside. Uh, in, in, uh, in the case of a, an airplane, it's usually going in the cargo part of the airplane where again it can get really, really cold and there uh, a, a severe change in air pressure. So all those elements are bringing new challenges to the packaging industry. So we want to make sure that uh, whatever solution we come up with, uh, they can withstand with those challenges and they can uh, pass the requirements for e-commerce. Okay, and our last FAQ, can you give any examples of what kinds of interactions can be expected between Aptar and the solution provider? Sure. Um, so we actually have many examples uh, uh, internally. Uh, so Aptar has a history of interacting with uh, different companies and uh, inventors. So we actually, uh, I, I sit in, a, in our facility in Lincolnton in North Carolina where we have what we call a BAP Expert Center. So BAP is a technology that after acquired from, uh, from an inventor. And uh, this inventor, actually in the beginning, there was uh, an agreement between after and, and this person where after was uh, a licensee of the technology. Uh, eventually, after took over uh, uh, the company and, and acquired the company and this inventor came and started to uh, work for after he is now an after employee uh, we have other instances where we work it with inventors uh, in the past uh, and they became consultants uh, to after uh, we had in instances when the inventors they participated in the project and we interacted in a way of uh, coming up with uh, strong IP uh, uh, to protect the invention. Um, and then we had royalty deals uh, where after was licensing uh, the IP. Um, and we had other instances where we worked with a company and, and they, be, they became a supplier. So there are many different ways, I guess, that we can interact uh, with the solution provider. And, and I think that's the beauty of this, this contest. We, once we, we get the ideas and we start having those interactions, uh, I think there are multiple ways that we can actually uh, uh, start the relationship between the two parties. Okay, very good. Thank you, Adolfo. Uh, we are now to the live Q&A portion of today's webinar. Um, if you have any questions, this is an excellent, excellent opportunity for you to pose them directly to uh, members of the Nine Sigma staff, uh, uh, representatives from APTAR, and get feedback to your questions uh, during today's webinar. So if you have questions, please feel free to uh, jot them down in the Q&A chat box, and we'll get to your questions uh, just as quickly as we can. If, however, we're not able to get to your question during today's webinar, uh, we'll address those questions and their relevant answers 
and post them to the project forum as well. So if you don't hear your question asked today, don't worry, uh, we'll get you the information that you're seeking. So with that in mind, our very first question, uh, is there a priority for the challenges? And if so, which ones? Uh, Hadolfo, you had referenced the challenges previously in your conversation. Um, so which of those challenges would be most important for our solution providers to address? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Um, I would say that the most important ones are the ones that are absolutely required by our customers. So um, the solution needs to seal the product. Uh, it needs to protect the product. So uh, oxygen barrier is part of that. And uh, it needs to dispense the product. So I, I would say that those are the top three uh, uh, challenges that we have. Uh, of course, it's a combination of how the solution is going to provide that and uh, and address all the other challenges to a certain degree. Uh, we always know that it can, uh, one particular solution can better address some challenges uh, and, and another solution might address different ones. And, and that's why we chose to uh, award different ideas uh, if we uh, find ideas that can address different challenges. Okay. Uh, our next question, what viscosity should we assume for the condiments? Okay, that's a good question because there is a, a wide range of viscosities there. Uh, I would say that a good start would be the what I call the top three condiments. Uh, so uh, ketchup, mayo, mustard, uh, those are the most popular condiments in the world. Uh, of course, there's a lot more than that. Uh, and even within those uh, three products, there is a, a range of viscosity. So if you start with those products and you can find those products in any supermarket, uh, you can start testing with those three products and, and that's a good place to start. Uh, even if you have a solution that works really well with just one of them, that's not a problem. As long as is the uh, uh, product being tested or the solution being tested with uh, some of those products are within the soft and condiments category, uh, we should be okay. Okay. Our very next question. Uh, we have a product that is probably not for condiments, but more for liquid, powder, or granule additions. Would that be of interest to Aptar? Uh, that's a great question and uh, we, as part of the rules for the, the contest, one of the things that we say is that uh, uh, we are open to receive different ideas. Um, uh, one thing to, to uh, highlight is that there are some condiments that are very liquid as well. So if you think about uh, soy sauce, so, uh, it's a sauce, it's a condiment that is also used. So it's very liquid. and it can be also uh, an application there. Uh, but even if we don't find the idea uh, can be applicable to sauces and condiments, uh, we might still be interested and pursue uh, uh, something further with that particular solution provider. But uh, if we cannot fit in any category we, within sauces and condiments, we might not be able to award that idea. So. Uh, since this contest is, is specifically, and we had to do that so we, we could uh, create some boundaries and make it clear what we were looking for, uh, we defined it that the sauces and condiments market was the market we were targeting. So even if you might have a solution that is not really applicable to this, we might still want to interact with you and, and learn more about your solution, uh, but we might not be able to award you uh, for this particular contest. Okay. Uh, this next question kind of stays in that same realm. Uh, should we assume a uniform consistency like mayonnaise, or is there potential for a non-uniform consistency like relish? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, like I said, it's sometimes it's very hard to have one solution that can address all different kinds of condiments. Uh, so we are okay if it works with mayo and it doesn't work with relish. Uh, of course, 
the more different products that the solution can work with, the better. But uh, we are okay if only works with one of them. And um, we have uh, we have some uh, different sauces like uh, salsa, for instance, there that has uh, chunks sometimes, and it's very difficult to address that too. Uh, but it doesn't need to necessarily work with every single different uh, uh, sauce or condiment in the market. Um, it needs to work with at least one of the categories inside that market, so it can be uh, legally, I would say, even legally eligible to receive the award. Would, would you agree with that, Pam? I do agree with that, and I think that's, that's a, a good response. I think the question really has to do, um, again, like the other question, you know, what kind of consistencies do you need? But I think that's I think that's appropriate. Uh, to kind of build off of that submitter's question, um, if their technology is geared towards a particular condiment, would you like them to indicate that in their response form? So, say I have a technology for relish, but it's not applicable to a more consistent condiment. Should I indicate that in my response form so that you're aware of? Um, the, the, the intended end-use application. Yeah, the more information that is provided to us, I think the better uh, for us to understand uh, where the ideas are coming from. So, uh, because sometimes we might be thinking about something different and, and we say, okay, this is not really applicable to uh, mayo or ketchup, but well, it might be applicable to, uh, to relish or salsa or soy sauce. So, yeah, absolutely. If, applicants can uh, indicate uh, what markets or categories they're uh, envisioning that solution to be used with, that would be great. Okay. Our next question, is it correct that the solution must be a closure or a part of a closure and not a design of a container such as a bottle? Uh, yeah, so after, it, like I said, is a dispensing solution provider. So uh, we we don't make only closures. We also have pumps, we have sprayers, we have uh, valves, we have different products that also dispense other products. So if that, uh, let's say if that solution requires a specific closure uh, in a specific bottle, that's okay. So if it needs to work, if the idea needs to work in combination of a closure and a bottle, uh, uh, I would say that yes, we're interested. If the idea is only a different bottle uh, and the bottle can be used with many different closures or uh, any solutions out there in the market today, uh, then that wouldn't be part of our business uh, or part of our core business, so we wouldn't be so interested in that. So hopefully I, I address the question. I think so. Uh, for the individual who submitted the question, if Adolfo uh, didn't quite uh, address your question, please feel free to expand on your question. We'll try to try our best to uh, circle back to it. Uh, in the meantime, our next question, uh, my invention requires an outside power source. Is that acceptable? Uh, yes, sure. So uh, I think that uh, as, as we're seeing, consumers are getting more and more interested in uh, integrated uh, solutions uh, and with the Internet of Things and, and the way that people are looking into uh, uh, making everything electronically and yeah absolutely it can be it can be a solution by all means okay uh, for our next question uh, it kind of goes to the end user uh, can we design our technology for a particular community for example senior citizens Absolutely, yes. Okay. Uh, the in next in your systems, it could be kids. Uh, sorry to cut you, Jonathan, but uh, yeah, it can be applicable to to a particular demographics. No, no doubt about it. Okay. Uh, these next two questions are related, so I'll, I'll ask them together. Uh, first question is: What sort of performance data would be most compelling? And the related question is, will a lack of performance data hurt my chances of winning the contest? Um, 
Well, like I said, the more information is provided, the better we can evaluate the idea. Uh, if you have an idea that has been tested and proved, uh, that's, that's always great to know. Uh, but if you have an idea that it hasn't been tested or if you don't have enough data, I think that's something that we can uh, bring our expertise in and, and, and address it. Uh, so, yeah, we can still uh, choose to award an idea uh, even if there's not uh, maybe enough data uh, to prove on it. Uh, and that is probably going to dictate also how the interactions are going to be moving forward. So um, we had cases, and, and coming back to that question, where uh, how we uh, interact with uh, uh, solution providers. Uh, we had cases where people only had an idea on a piece of paper and they had this functionality in mind and they didn't have uh, the resources, the money, the time, whatever the case was, uh, to build a prototype mode and test it or do consumer research or whatever the case was. And we said, okay, we can, we can work in all of that. We can fund all of that. Uh, and 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 we negotiated a, a, an agreement that was good for both parties. So yeah, absolutely. If you don't have the data to prove everything, but if we see merit in the idea, uh, we might want to award it anyway. Okay. Uh, this next question goes to uh, post contest timeline. How soon after the contest should a technology be ready for commercialization? Well, I, th I think it's kind of related to the last question, too. So, uh, of course, we all want to uh, 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 hit the market as soon as possible. But uh, if we have an idea that we still need to prove out, we still need to prototype, uh, we still need to do consumer research to make sure that consumers would be uh, happy with it, uh, I don't think that that's a problem. Our target uh, when we're developing new products is to have uh, something in the market between 12 and 18 months. So I think it's going to be very hard that we have, that we find like drop-in solutions where we can simply uh, uh, start producing and applying to our existing products the way they are today. So we are totally prepared to uh, make the, the investments that are necessary to adjust them to our reality and then uh, commercialize them uh, within 12 to 18 months afterwards. That's that's the ideal target. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, before we proceed with our next question, let me just encourage our attendees today uh, to ask your questions uh, during today's webinar. Uh, as as you can tell by listening to, uh, to Pam and, and Rodolfo, uh, they know this project inside and out. So if you've got questions, now would be a fantastic opportunity for you to pose your questions to them and get feedback very, very promptly. Uh, that's not to say that after today's webinar you won't be able to get that information. Uh, we'll actually discuss that in a little bit here, uh, but now would be a great time to pose your questions to these uh, well-informed representatives. Uh, moving on to our next question, um, what volume container is this dispensing technology intended for? Okay. Well, there's a big range there as well. So, uh, depending on the country, the region where we are, and and even depending on the product, uh, it can go from uh, 50 grams to uh, maybe 500 grams, or from uh, 100 ml to uh, over uh, one liter. So, I would say that the range that we're looking for is uh, is is the the what people typically use in their day-to-day. Uh, -day. So it's for the products that you usually keep in your fridge at home. Uh, so usually, if we think about, we're not looking too much uh, for solutions for the uh, for being used in restaurants, where they, they're typically using very large uh, packages, right? Uh, that market is significantly smaller, so when we look at, um, at solutions for those markets, uh, they tend to be very different from uh, the markets that we are in today. So 
have it in mind that uh, as we said, our main customers are Grab Times, Unilever, uh, P&G, Nestle. So they are consumer good companies uh, supplying to consumers like, like us. So I would say that is the typical range that you would find in your fridge. Okay, great. Uh, our next question circles back to the question of end users. Uh, if, a, if, a, if, a, if a technology would have multiple end users, should we submit separate proposals or just mention the target markets on a single submission? Hadassah, I think I'll take that one. Um, if the idea is the same, for multiple target markets, then it, is, it should be one um, separate, it, it is one submission. If the idea is different uh, based on what that target market is, then by all means, you know, create a new submission. However, you know, it's really all about the idea itself and not the end market. Okay, thank you, Pam. Uh, did you have anything that you'd like to add there, Hidalfo? No, 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 I totally agree. I think that's, that's spot on. Okay. Uh, our next question, are there specific dispensing technologies that are not of interest? Well, I would say technologies that we already have. So uh, if you go to our website, you're going to see a wide uh, variety of products that we have today. So uh, as I said, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're not looking for a new uh, design of uh, flip top closure because we have that and, and, and just changing the design is not going to add any functionality to it. Just changing the aesthetics of it is not going to add any functionality. Now, if you have a change in design that can be adaptable to our solutions and is going to bring a new functionality to it, then we are definitely interested in that. So it can be something that is, uh, I don't know, maybe inside a closure or, or a pump that is going to bring a, a different uh, functionality to them, uh, then I would say, yes, we're, we're interested in looking at that. Okay. Uh, our next question goes to kind of the, the actual dispensing of condiments. Uh, and the question is, are you looking to, looking to target a specific volume for each dispensing or a specific orifice size? Should dispensing volume and orifice size be variable? That's a good question, and and back to that question uh, about uh, viscosity. Uh, those are usually the ways that we address that issue. So if we have a solution that works really really well with uh, uh, a ketchup, it might not work really well with mayo because of the different viscosity. So usually by changing the orifice uh, and 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 uh, some other design elements, we can address and correct uh, and perfect the performance so we can address different viscosities. So if you only have one uh, that works really well with one product, uh, that's not a problem uh, because usually we can uh, address that functionality and, and adapt to other viscosities as well. Can I add to that too? Sure. I think any solution provider that has a novel mechanism that, that has a specific orifice size or dispensing volume or can address that, um, please put that information into your submission. Describe what you see as the end use and the benefits of your design. Okay, thank you, Adolfo. Yeah. Thank you, Pam. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, another question here. And Adolfo, you touched on this uh, briefly a little bit. Uh, are there specific materials that should be avoided uh, in a proposed solution? That's a great question, too. So. Um, when we talked about sustainability, we said that uh, our, the brand owners and consumers, they're always looking for uh, recyclable uh, uh, materials. Uh, and a lot of times they're looking into trying to keep the materials uh, in the packaging as consistent as possible. So, um, for instance, uh, we show that the, the solutions out there today, they have an aluminum liner. However, the bottle is plastic, the closure is plastic, the labels are usually plastic. So that aluminum liner, it, it can be a problem for the recycling stream in case it's, uh, in case the, the, the consumer doesn't remove it completely. So 
I think that's something to have in mind. Uh, it's not a total a total uh, 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 deal breaker if you have a solution that can be completely separated before consumers are uh, actually uh, 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 disposing them. So, for instance, we still have in the marketplace uh, bottles that are plastic with metal closures uh, or glass packages with metal closures, but once consumers are throwing those away, they can easily split them up and then discard them properly. So, if if it is easy to do that, and that's going to be part of uh, the, the 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 way we're going to evaluate uh, the ideas, uh, I think that's not a problem. So we can have different materials, uh, but we need to have that sustainability aspect in mind uh, to make sure we're not creating something that is not going to be uh, recyclable or sustainable. Very good. Thank you, Valso. Uh, at the moment, it looks like we have gone through the list of questions from our attendees. Uh, to our attendees, if you think of a question uh, that you'd like to pose to either Pam or to Hadolfo, uh, don't worry. We'll have some additional information here in just a moment about how you can get answers to that question. Uh, given that we don't have any new questions at this time, we'll go ahead and proceed to our next slide. So, what can you do today? First off, you can visit the Dispenser Genius Challenge page on Nine Sites. You can see the URL listed there. If you need any assistance with your submission with your Nine Sites account, you have a question you'd like to pose to the Aptar team, there's two ways you can go about uh, getting that information. First off is via email. The email address for the Nine Sigma Solution Provider Help Desk is right there on your screen. It's phd at ninesigma.com. Alternatively, you can call the provider help desk at 216-283-3901. And a very key piece of information I'd like to bring to your attention one more time is the submission deadline, November 15th, 2017 at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. As Pam mentioned, uh, we strongly encourage you to submit your proposal uh, uh, sooner rather than later, and we, we encourage you to not wait to the last minute uh, at 4.59 to begin logging into your account and trying to submit your proposal. Uh, help yourself out, submit, yourself, submit your proposal early, and make sure that you get your proposal in. To our representatives from Aptar and from Nine Sigma, thank you all for your time today and for your expertise. To our attendees, thank you for your time, and we look forward to receiving your submission. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll do our best to get you the information you're looking for. Thank you all one last time and have a great day.